The Israeli Air Force has reportedly carried out another airstrike in Aleppo International Airport in northern Syria. Breaking news, we have just learned of two new attacks on U.S. forces in Syria, this time with rockets and drones. You want to escalate now in the Middle East while escalating in Ukraine, while simultaneously preparing in a half-assed way for an invasion over the strait in Taiwan. From flooding and tornadoes on the ground to a meteor, the U.S., had some wild conditions this week. We begin here this morning with the news breaking overnight, a string of deadly storms that swept across the southeast. At least 24 people were killed in Mississippi when a tornado touched down just after sundown. Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. The Israeli Air Force has reportedly carried out another airstrike in Aleppo International Airport in northern Syria. According to foreign reports, the strikes were carried out early this morning and there was no report of casualties. A runway was reportedly closed due to the damages. It was a second time that Aleppo airport had been hit in recent weeks. In an effort to stifle pro-Iranian militias, Israel is believed to have carried out hundreds of strikes on targets inside government-controlled parts of Syria in recent years. According to the Sana News Agency, on this occasion, Israeli fighters flying over the Mediterranean Sea fired several missiles that struck an airport runway, putting it out of commission. In line with policy, there was no comment from the IDF and rarely discusses the operations. Israel has confirmed that it targets bases of Iran allied groups such as Lebanon's Hezbollah, which has forces in Syria. Israel views Iran's expansion throughout Syria as a continued threat to national security, and Israel has reportedly conducted strikes across a broad range of targets in an effort to curb Iran's forces in the region. The Bible tells us there are three possible prophecies on the verge of finding fulfillment. Isaiah 17:1, in which Damascus, Syria will be destroyed in a single night. Jeremiah 49, the prophecy of Alam which could infer an Israeli attack upon Iran's nuclear program, Ezekiel 38 and 39, known as the War of Gog and Magog. In this prophecy, a coalition of nations led by Russia, Iran, and Turkey will attack Israel in the last days in order to take Israel's wealth. As a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus declares, And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Breaking news, we have just learned of two new attacks on U.S. forces in Syria, this time with rockets and drones. This means at least four attacks now in the past 36 hours. The first of the attacks was on a U.S. base by a suspected Iranian drone killing one American contractor, wounding another, and injuring five U.S. service members as well. The U.S. has launched airstrikes in retaliation in response to those first attacks. We're just learning of these additional attacks tonight. Air Force F-15 fighter jets taking to the skies, destroying two Iranian-aligned facilities. U.S. intelligence saying the first deadly attack on U.S. forces was conducted by a one-way attack drone made in Iran, one of the two most recent ones also using drones. President Biden, who authorized the retaliatory airstrike, saying just a short time ago that the U.S. does not seek conflict with Iran, but is prepared to, quote, act forcefully to protect our people. Word at least one U.S. service member has been injured in these newest attacks tonight. 
Tonight, four separate attacks on U.S. forces in Syria in 36 hours, one of them deadly. In response, U.S. F-15s destroying two Iranian-aligned training and equipment facilities in Syria. To make no mistake, the United States does not, does not emphasize, seek conflict with Iran, but be prepared for us to act forcefully, protect our people. That's exactly what happened last night. It was 6.38 a.m. Eastern Time on Thursday when an explosive-laden Iranian drone came hurtling down on the U.S. base in northeast Syria, leaving one American contractor dead, one wounded, and five U.S. service members injured as well. Four of the Americans medically evacuated. Central Command immediately planning counter-strikes. And just hours later, President Biden aboard Air Force One authorizing the retaliatory attacks, sending two F-15s into the air and hitting their targets. There are currently 900 American service members and hundreds more contractors in Syria as part of a counter-ISIS force. The attacks against those forces by these Iranian-backed proxies have been relentless. Nearly 80 rocket or drone attacks in the last two years this is the first time the U.S. has hit targets in Syria since August, and the first time an American has been killed in Syria in a drone attack. Throughout the morning, we've had various guests come on and talk about how weakness has invited these types of attacks. Uh, Congressman Michael Waltz just referenced, he tweeted a chart yesterday, Dan, I don't know if you saw it, but it shows the number of, of rocket attacks from, from Iranian and Iranian-affiliated forces over the last several years. You can see the spike. It's not hard to yeah. see the correlation. What are your thoughts when we see this news this morning and, and the environment that has created that spike? Well, I, I got a lot to say. Let me just say first, uh, pray that the Lord God give those folks in Mississippi the strength to deal with the uh, incredible obstacles ahead after that uh, deadly tornado. Here's where, where I'm confused, Will. You know, I come from the world of reason. That's what conservatives do, right? Does a policy work or does it not? Has it been tried in the past and what were the results? So in the world of reason, uh, I, I look for, you know, spreadsheet type results. Here are the inputs, give me the outputs. So you're trying to tell me, like right, the military strategists and a lot of these political folks, you're trying to tell me that you have less than a thousand troops in the region to prevent the quote, reconstitution of ISIS while you just abandoned Afghanistan and billions of dollars of military equipment while you were there to supposedly prevent the reconstitution of al-Qaeda. Can everybody just digest that for a minute and explain to me in what world that makes sense? So you abandoned an entire country after a decade of war, probably a trillion dollars in net assets given there over time and opportunity costs, right? Countless deaths. You forfeit the whole country. You give them one of the world's biggest armies and billions of equipment and now you're telling me we're in Syria and you've got people on both the Republican and Democrat side who want to escalate this fight. You want to escalate now in the Middle East while escalating in Ukraine, while simultaneously preparing in a half-assed way for an invasion over the strait in Taiwan. And, and that makes sense to you. With a nuclear powder, that makes perfect. You're sitting at a table going, yeah, sure, we can do all this. Explain this to me, too, using reason. You've got the Biden administration that goes over and by the way, humiliates the Saudis. We have to deal with a lot of bad actors around the world. So you've got this rotting bag of oatmeal in the White House who on one hand is saying, hey, listen, you Saudis really suck. Let me give you a fist bump and get humiliated. Saudis, the only natural real counterweight over there outside of Israel to the Iranian death to America people, and you insult them too. So Iran and Syria is such a dangerous problem for us. We have a natural counterweight in the Saudis, in this kind of Sunni-Shia generational rivalry they got going, this Hatfields and McCoys for the generation, and we crap on both of them? And again, you're at a table going, ah, oh, makes perfect sense. Guys, I'm sorry, I live in the real world. You cannot alienate the Saudis, wokeify our military, cut our Navy short of the ships they need, uh, re miss recruiting budgets for our army, fight a war in Ukraine, fight a war in China, fight a war in Africa, fight a war in Europe. You can't do this all at the same time. Now, let's defend Poland. Let's defend NATO. Let's defend Syria. Let's de how? How? We're $30 trillion in debt and we can't even defend our own freaking border down south? Yeah. Please tell me in what world any of this makes sense. 
I'm baffled. You know who's laughing right now? Putin. There is nothing Putin and Xi want more right now than the United States distracted in the Middle East. This is what they want. It serves two purposes. It keeps us military, militarily distracted and also enriches the Petro states and fills their coffers with money we're sending overseas to buy petrochemicals we have right here. Uh, this is just national suicide, man. Proverbs 29.2. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules, the people groan. From flooding and tornadoes on the ground to a meteor, the U.S. had some wild conditions this week. Dramatic weather scenes in the U.S. this week. Oh my God! A tornado ripped through Montebello in Southern California. The roof is flying up. Sheesh! Damaging multiple buildings and injuring at least two people. What the hell is going on? The National Weather Service said the tornado was the strongest to impact the Los Angeles metro area since 1983. Meanwhile, much of California remains underwater after days of heavy rain and flooding. Meanwhile, residents in South Dakota were also treated to a star show, but blink and you'll miss it. A meteor lit up the sky above Watertown in the early hours of Thursday morning. We begin here this morning with the news breaking overnight, a string of deadly storms that swept across the southeast. At least 24 people were killed in Mississippi when a tornado touched down just after sundown. Mississippi's governor says search and rescue operations are underway and that emergency crews are surging to the area's hardest hit by the storm. But getting a clear picture of just how damaging the storm is won't come until daylight. We knew that we were getting close to where the tornado hit because it was getting pitch black. And many of the communities where the tornado did hit, they are without power. We brought generators so you're able to see what we are able to see. And this is what we're seeing. Homes like this behind me here missing their roof. Just next to it, cars have been spun around and, and wood smash through the vehicles. We're starting to see down trees, power lines that are splintered, and we're expecting it to get much worse when the sun comes up. Tornado! You're out there, right? Massive tornado! Just before 8 o'clock Friday night, a storm system ripped through Mississippi, producing a tornado that touched down, causing catastrophic damage to communities across the state. In Rolling Fork, Mississippi, around 60 miles northwest of Jackson, what were once buildings are now piles of scattered debris. The twister moved northeast, devastating other rural communities. Officials are pleading for help. The deadly twisters come on the heels of damaging storms on Thursday and Friday. In southern Missouri, a car with six teenagers inside was swept away by floodwaters. Two did not survive. And at least two tornadoes swept through North Texas Friday morning with winds of 100 miles per hour. Eric Huntley dug through what was left of his home. As soon as I got the alert, I, I went to go look outside. And then I heard the moan. And I'll never forget that sound. All right, joining us on the phone right now, Zachary Hall. He's a professional storm chaser who was able to view the destruction in Mississippi firsthand. Zachary, uh, you're in Rolling Fork right now. Describe what you're seeing. I'm looking at pure destruction. Uh, vehicles tossed, trees completely debarked. I'm actually staring right at an American flag in the middle of, I'm not sure what this used to be. It's complete rubble now, but it's just uh, apocalyptic, I guess is the best way to describe what I'm seeing. You seeing people who, you know, are emerging from rubble, who survived this, who are assessing their losses. What are you seeing in terms of human life? Well, most of the response here is local, <clears throat> excuse me, local first responders. Uh, locals, family members here to help. Uh, we were actually here last night and observed the tornado come into town, and we were the first on scene. So we observed the emergence from the rubble and, and that sort of thing last night. Uh, I know that there are still some people who are not accounted for, unfortunately. Uh, right now, a lot of it is just trying to help people clean up, get get, get things out of their home that they need. Uh, like I said earlier, there's vehicles on top of homes, things tossed miles. It's just uh, it's, it's, it's crazy. Mm. And we're looking at what appears to be drone footage right now, and, and you're right, it is just apocalyptic.
I thought I would do. Small town mourns after massive devastation. It looks like a war zone over here. An entire roadside of homes and businesses off of Highway 61 are just gone. And, and as you can see, no one has a home here. After Rolling Fork, Mississippi took a direct hit from a deadly tornado. And in this small town, residents lost a lot more than their buildings. Because we had to help dead bodies out of the house. So that is very, that is very disturbing. Like actually seeing people losing their lives over a bad weather like this, that is not nothing happy. Survivors like Shanta Howard say it was a fight for their life when the tornado hit. I was going through my head. Lord, I don't want to die. I I don't want to die. Why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? We live in a world full of pain and suffering. And there is no one, including Christians, who are not affected by the hard realities of life. The question, why do bad things happen to good people, is one of the most difficult questions in all of theology. God is sovereign, so all that happens must be allowed by Him, if not directly caused by Him. We must understand that human beings cannot expect to fully understand God's thoughts and ways as we read in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. In the book of Job, Job was a righteous man, yet he suffered in ways that none of us can even imagine, as we read in Job 1, 1. There was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. God allowed Satan to do everything he wanted to Job except kill him, and Satan did his worst. What was Job's reaction? Job's reaction was to trust God and to bless him. Job 121, and he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job 13.15, though he slay me, Yet will I trust him. Even so, I will defend my own ways before him. Job didn't understand why God had allowed the things he did, but he knew God was good and therefore continued to trust in him. That should be a believer in Jesus' reaction as well. As hard as it is to acknowledge, we must admit to ourselves that we are sinners and there are no good people, as we read in Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Even on your best day, we are like filthy rags, as we read in Isaiah 64, 6. But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Bad things may happen to good people in this world, but this world is not the end. Christians have an eternal perspective, as we read in 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, Yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Bad things happen to good people, but God uses those bad things for good, as we read in Romans 8.28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. Bad things happen to good people, but those bad things equip believers for deeper ministry, as we read in 2 Corinthians 1, 3-5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble, with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Bad things happen to good people, and the worst things happen to the best person. Jesus is the only truly righteous one, yet he suffered more than we can imagine, and we should follow in his footsteps, as we read in 1 Peter 2, 20-23. For what credit is it if, when you are beaten, for your faults, you take it patiently. But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, 
when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Romans 5.8 declares, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Despite our sinful nature, God still loves us. God loves the world so much that he sent his only begotten son to die for us, as we read in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God allows things to happen for a reason. Whether or not we understand his reasons, we must remember that God is good, just, loving, and merciful. Psalm 135, 3. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises to his name, for it is pleasant. Bad things happen to us that we simply cannot understand. Instead of doubting God's goodness, our reaction should be to trust him. As we read in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive in faith the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Biblical repentance is changing your mind about Jesus Christ and turning to God in faith for salvation. Turning from sin is not the definition of repentance, but it is one of the results of genuine faith-based repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.